Hello, my name is Xander. Welcome back to the Django ORM series. In this tutorial, we start a journey exploring full text search capabilities using Django and a Postgres database. A common task or expectation for web applications is to provide search capabilities. In a simple case, this could be filtering a list of objects by category, color, or maybe just size. Full text search or just text search features can offer a more advanced way to search a database. A more complex use case might require searching with weighting, for example, categorization, highlighting, multiple languages, and indexing. So these are some of the features we will start to explore in this tutorial using Postgres database full text search features. If you are currently using SQLite or SQLite for your project and you do wish to start implementing full text search, SQLite is generally considered sufficient for development purposes. We will need a more powerful database such as Postgres database, which does offer full text search capabilities. So you have a few options here if you want to follow this tutorial from start to finish. Now you could go ahead and install Postgres database directly onto your computer. So go ahead and go to the website, Postgres database website, download it for Mac or Windows or Linux, and we can start from there. Now probably an easier way of working is utilizing visualization with Docker. So if you were to type in Docker desktop download, download that to your machine. Again, it's capable, sorry, it's compatible with Windows, Linux, and Mac. And just go through the installation. It's pretty simple. You probably need to restart. And then we can then utilize this tool to actually run an instance of Postgres uh, database in a container without having you actually installing it onto your operating system. So in this tutorial, we do choose Docker and I do recommend downloading Docker. Like I said, if you want to follow this tutorial uh, throughout the whole, for the whole duration of this tutorial. This is the plan for this tutorial. Hopefully by the end of this tutorial, I hope to have given you an entry point into full text search techniques when utilizing Django and Postgres database. The reality here is that this tutorial could go on for hours, such as the quantity of information on this topic. I will try to, in this tutorial, give you a starting point and also direct you to some more material for further research and reading. So you may have noticed or you may have expected Elasticsearch. So beyond the techniques featured here in this tutorial, there is a next step, which is Elasticsearch, which is a more advanced, robust and platform independent search engine, which provides for text search. So this is an advanced technique, which I'll cover in a later tutorial. Having said that, you might be thinking, well, there's no need to learn these techniques here. Why not just go for Elasticsearch? Well, Elasticsearch could be considered complete overkill for your particular project. Techniques presented here can still be valuable in many use cases. From the topics, you can see that we're going to start uh, with contains, I contains, and we go through it step by step, and we slowly move then into more kind of proprietary aspects of Postgres database. So we're moving to search, we have a little bit of theory there, what's going um, on in behind the scenes uh, in Postgres database. We move on to search vectors, search ranking, and weights, and then we move on to trigram similarity and distance, and then finish off with headline. So that should give you a good grounding into some of the technologies you can utilize when implementing full text search. The final stage of this tutorial, we move into indexes. So we're going to build utilizing Django and Postgres database, a gin index, and then that's going to help the performance um, of our search. So it's a really kind of valuable piece of knowledge here, and it isn't well documented how to actually develop and implement a, an index with Django and Postgres database. So let's get started. Step one. Now this is an optional step. There is code. If you head over to the video uh, description, you'll find a link to the code for this tutorial as well as some notes. And uh, in there, you'll find kind of a starting build. So if you didn't want to go through this, this step here, but you did want to follow the rest of the steps in this tutorial, you can go ahead and download that. Alternatively, if you are new to Django and want a little bit of practice, we are going to go through a setup here of installing or setting up a virtual environment. We then create a new project. We'll go through Docker Compose, setting up Postgres database and PG admin. 
and then we go through um, build on model. So we download some data or we download a data set from Kaggle and then we go ahead and just prepare that into a Django fixture and then we load that into the database and then finally we go ahead and build a simple form view template and URL so we can then access a what will be a simple search form so users can start typing in and searching. So go ahead and head over to section two of this tutorial the, there's a timeline in the video description um, or else let's get started building our app. So I've gone ahead and created a new folder on my desktop here. That's where I'm going to be working from. I open up Visual Studio Code and I'm just going to open that folder on the desktop. So I go ahead and select that folder, the app folder. And now I'm going to then start to build my application. So I just drag this up here, the terminal. So let's go ahead. First of all, this is a Windows machine. Let's not forget that it will be slightly different on Mac and Linux. So I'm just going to create a, a virtual, a virtual environment. So that's going to build a new folder called VEMV. So now I just need to go in and activate it. So now I've activated my virtual environment. I'm working inside now my virtual environment, which has kind of uh, Python now installed within it and pip and all the tools that I'm going to need to get started. So we're using Django. So let's go ahead and pip install Django. So from the Python packet index, we would download and install Django. And that should be that should be that done to take a couple of seconds. So once we've done that, we just need to now create a new project. So let's use Django admin. So that's going to hook into uh, Django that we've just installed to allow us to perform uh, an action. So we want to start a new project and I'm just going to call this core space and then a dot full stop. So that's just going to load that folder inside of this folder and not create a folder within a folder. For my project so that's how i want to work here so now i've created this folder here and um, i've got my manage pi file there so i can now use manage pi um, which is kind of a wrapper around django admin to perform another management command which is going to be start app and i'm going to call this app book there we go so there's my new app so next up let's go into the core settings uh, we just need to add books to the installed apps because we're going to build a database in books. So we want that to be accessible within our project. So we install, or we define book as an app within our project. So now we've connected up to our core project here. Uh, let's go ahead and access model. So this is going to be a really simple database, two fields. Okay, so you can slow this down because I'm just going to bring this in line by line and just chat about it. So let's bring in import models so we can extend and build some models. We're going to bring in our utilities from translation because we may want to provide some translation on our uh, models later on at some point. So let's go ahead and bring in our class here, book. So we're going to create a new table called book. And then we're going to have two fields, which is going to be title, character field and authors. So just two model, two fields here. And then we'll go ahead and give us a title, preparing it for translation. And then here, look, this looks crazy, max length 1000. Um, so that's quite a long title, but I'm not going to clean the data. So the data that I'm going to be utilizing from Kaggle, I'm not going to spend too much time cleaning it. And I know there are some really long titles and authors um, So in those fields. So, it, so I'm just going to go with max length 1000, see if that's enough. If it's not big enough, it, Django would tell me. And I'll just extend that if needed. So no equals false and DB index true. So these are just some additional properties attributes that I've applied here. Um, you can go ahead and read what they are trying to do. So they do come in to play later on um, once we start utilizing an index. So let's go ahead and create an author as well. So that's just going to be max length again 1000 because again in the data that I'm downloading and utilizing and loading into this database table. There's just some really long authors um, in that field. If that doesn't make sense, I'll, I'll point it out later once we start working with the data. Right, so now we've got our book model completed. Let's now go ahead. Now, we are going to be utilizing a Postgres database, so we can't migrate at this point. We are now going to need to set up our database. So let's go ahead and create a new file here. 
So now I'm assuming that you have installed Docker because we're now going to create a Docker Compose file, which is a YAML extension. Okay, so with that ready, we now need to describe the services that we want to run in Docker. So if you haven't used Docker before, uh, if you go to the bottom right hand corner, if you've installed Docker, you'll see a little ship with some containers. That icon, if you open that up, that would bring open or that will open up Docker Desktop if you've installed Docker Desktop. So you can see Docker Desktop here. Um, I can't slim this down. That's why it's kind of stretched over a little bit more. So you can see that we're going to be downloading some images, Postgres and PG admin image, and then that's going to build containers. So what we're going to have inside of a little container here um, is we're going to have these two containers, these cluster of containers here. This is going to be running software and an operating system within a container. So we don't need to install Postgres and PG admin. We just need to run it within a container utilizing Docker technologies. So that's going to actually then uh, create a, a database in a container, which we could then utilize for our project. And obviously that's a Postgres database. Now to actually get these services up and running, we're going to need to describe, or we're going to need to build this Docker Compose file here, which is going to describe the services, the features and the attributes, parameters that we want to set up to actually build that image and that container. So let's go ahead and do this. So first of all, line one. So I'm just going to bring this in line by line. That allows me to talk. I can't type and talk. My brain can't handle it. So version 3.8, because specifying the uh, format um, that this file will conform to. So currently 3.8. So we're now going to describe the services that we want to bring in or develop within some containers. So the first thing here, PGDB, this is just the name I've described this service. You can call it whatever you like. So this is Postgres database. And be careful with the indentation here. It needs to be as described here or as shown. So first of all, when I build a container, um, I want to describe or give it a name. So PG admin books or PGDB books, sorry. So that's going to be the name of the container. Now the image, if you're new to Docker, you won't know about images. So essentially what's happening here is that someone's pre-built a version. So someone's pre-built an image. On that image is an operating system and a Postgres database pre-installed, ready to go. And what we're going to do is we're going to draw down, we're going to download that image, in this case from the official Postgres image, uh, the, the official Postgres image from Docker Hub. And we're going to take that image and build a container. So the image provides all the information to build a, a real container, which has an operating system running and a Postgres database. And then we can then utilize that as um, a real database we can hook into from Django here. All right, so that's our image that we want to use. Restart. So if this container fails, we're just going to try and restart. Now we need to be able to access the service in this container. So there's no way inside of this container unless we open a port up. So imagine this is a doorway into our container, which is running this database. So we're going to use port 5432 from our machine. So on our local machine, if we try to point anything at door 5432, that's going to open up the door for this in this container and then access this container services. And this service is listening. It's looking for data to be sent and received on 5432 port. So therefore it will receive the data that we send to it as long as we send it on 5432 port. Right, so now we go ahead and set up the environment. So there's loads of different things we can set up here. If you go over to Docker Hub, type this in, you'll see all the environment variables that we can set up here. So here I'm gonna describe the database name, the username and password, because we need security on our database. And that's pretty much it really. So now what we've done, we've, we've told Docker to download this image, set up these um, variables when it builds a container so we can access this new database called Postgres. We can access that by the user Postgres and password Postgres. Okay, right, so now we're gonna install PG Admin, which is a user interface that allows us to administrate um, via a kind of web-based tool allows us to administrate our database. So we'll see that in action that make more sense once we actually see it. But this is a tool that we're going to spin up in an individual container. So here we're going to give it a container name and then the image is going to be from dpage PG admin four. So that's where the image is currently going to be downloaded from, from Docker Hub. Restart always again 
and then set up some environment variables. So again, username and password. The username is your email and a password. There we go. Okay, so again, if we want to access this, we're going to need to do this through our doors, our ports. So if I point my browser at 5050 port, that's going to go to port 80 on this container, and then I'll be able to see this service running. So that's all we need to do here. So let's go ahead and just make sure Docker is running. So in the bottom right hand corner, if you've got Docker running, there should be a little Docker icon in your um, in your tray. Uh, so I'm just going to click on that. You can't see that on your screen. So I'm just going to open up Docker desktop. There we go. So you can see that there are no containers running. I do have some images that are pre-downloaded uh, to speed up this process, but these images here will get downloaded when we run the command in a second for you. So let's go ahead now and run uh, Docker Compose. I'm just going to go for up. So I'm going to use a Docker up command. That's basically going to now start the process of reading this file, uh, downloading these images. It's going to download these images here. Then it's going to then try and build some containers with these images. And you, see, you can now see that well, I already have my images downloaded, but you can now see that the containers cluster of containers have started. You can see the names of the containers that we've described in our Docker Compose file and everything seems to be running. It tells me the port numbers as well that these services are working on. So I can now open my browser. So I go ahead and I point my browser to the loopback address and then 5050, remember that's the port number to access PG admin. So that's going to get translated into the into the container, the PG admin container of port 80. And now you can see we've got PG admin. So remember the username and password, aaa.com and password was a. So that's what we described or we set up in the Docker Compose file. And now we can log in. So once we've logged in, we now need to actually hook into our server. So our server is running in that other container, our database server. So let's add a new server. Let's just call this um, Postgres. And then we'll go to the connection. So the name of this is going to be the name of our container. So that was pgdb. That's what we described in our Docker Compose file and the service name. So that's going to be port 5432. The table or the database was called Postgres. The username was Postgres. The password was Postgres. That's what we've set up in Docker Compose. Press save. And you can see instantly we've now logged in to our database. So at the moment we don't have anything in our schema tables so we don't have any tables at the moment so that's where all the tables can be found in our postgres database here so let's go ahead now and migrate and that would just now allow us to test the connection between django and our database now in order for us to do that um, you can see here that this is where we run Docker compose and this has given me an output for all those different services so i'm just going to create a new terminal here I'll keep that running in the background. That allows me to see if there's any problems, etc., from either the PG admin terminal or the um, Postgres database terminal. Okay, so you, you don't need to run this, um, but I'm going to run it for the duration of this tutorial in case there are any problems. Right, so now we need to hook up our Django app to the Postgres database. So let's go into core and settings. Now you may have done this before, but here in line 77, we have databases described. So this is basically just describing uh, the database that we want to connect to for this project. So I'm just gonna have all this pre-prepared. Um, so here's the database connection details to connect to our Postgres database. So here we have a name, username, and password. That's what we've described in our Docker Compose file and the host and the port number should match. And here we've got an engine. So here, what we're gonna to need to do in order for us to actually send data to actually communicate with Postgres database, we need some sort of way of translating our language into Postgres database language. We need some sort of connection um, capability. So we're going to install this here, which is, um, which is like I was described really is kind of a, a library of tools that allows us to connect and communicate with our Postgres database. So let's just pip install. Um, so here I'm going to uh, install the binary version um, of these tools. 
Um, I'm doing that because I know that some people have problems installing this and so it's just easier to install this. If you're utilizing Linux or Mac, it's going to be slightly different. You can probably just install um, the, the normal version of these tools. Right, so let's go ahead and Let's go ahead and pip install this. I'm not too sure if that installed. No. Okay. So bear with me. Pip install cop g2 binary. There we go. So that's now installed. Uh, so let's just uh, pip freeze so we know where we're at. So that's going to give us a list now of all of our dependencies, all of our add-ons that we've added in or installed. So you can see that we've got uh, the Postgres binary there. Right, so with that now done, we should now be able to connect and migrate our database models over to our database. So let's go ahead and do that. So make migrations. So there's our migration. And let's now go ahead and migrate. So it looks like everything is okay. So we can now go back to PG Admin here. We can now refresh this and right click again. Oh, sorry, left click the tables. You can now see all the tables that we've just um, added to our database. So it looks like everything is working okay. Uh, so let's move on now and start to actually add some data into our database base. So for this, we're going to need Kaggle. Using Google search, I've typed in books data set. That's taken me to Kaggle. So here I can look at the data set. So this is the data set that's on offer. So I've logged in. You will need to sign up here. So there are other services available for this. So all I'm doing here is I just want some data. Now there's around about 11,000, 10,000 unique values here or unique rows in this data set. So you just need to download this, log in and download. Now, I do have a copy of this. If you go to the GitHub repository for this tutorial, you will find all, the, all of the resources there. So you don't need to download this necessarily, but this is where the data set originated from. So I've gone ahead, I've downloaded that file, the CSV books file. I've now also removed some of the different columns that I didn't need here in Excel. Um, and I'm left with just author, title. I've added ID, which matches up my database, and then also model. So because I'm building a fixture and I want to convert this into a JSON file in a second, I'm going to need to tell Django where I want this data. So in this case, we've got the book app and then we've got the book table. So essentially that's where this data will, will go, will be inserted into, the, into our database. Right, so in addition to that, I've gone ahead and I've just cleaned some of this data up a little bit. Um, so this should be good to go. Now, this file is available if you download the repository for this tutorial. So you don't need to do this yourself if you don't want to. It's all ready to go. So what we need to do now is build a Django fixture. So a Django fixture is a way of kind of automatically automating inserting data into the database. So what we're going to need to do here in books is we're going to need to build a new folder called fixture, fixtures plural, and inside of here we're going to need to now build a JSON file. Well, many, we can use many different file types, but um, we're going to be utilizing a JSON file. And then we're going to tell Django to load that data into the database. So we need to prepare in actual fact, we need to kind of prepare a file. So I'm just going to bring in that Excel or the CSV file. Okay, so that I bring that into my fixtures first. So this is the CSV file that I've kind of cleaned the data from. And you can see roughly what the data is all about here, the data that's included, sorry, in this file. So now I've got that, I need to prepare this now into a JSON file. So this is just one of many ways you can perform this, but here in Windows, what I'm going to do is I'm going to load up um, a PowerShell. So I'm going to bring up a, a Windows PowerShell here. OK. And what I'm going to do now do is just access this folder. So you can see where this folder resides. So I just need to change directory to that folder. So let's go ahead and CD 
into that folder. So now I'm working within that folder. Right, so I can type in ls to list all the items in that folder. So now I've got this. What I need to now do is I now need to convert this, this file here into a JSON file. So what I can now do is I can run this command here. Now you are going to find in the repository a file called notes.md. All the commands that I use here will be in there. So you can see what I'm doing here is I'm creating this variable here and I'm going to take my CSV file. Now I just need to change the name of this. In actual fact, my CSV file is called uh, book title author 2 v2. And then I need to convert that into JSON. That's what I'm doing here. So that's going to be inserted into this variable or saved into this variable. And then I can go and grab that and I can save it as the file that I want to um, save it as. So in this case, I want to save it as my data.json. So I take all that data, put it into this file, my JSON, and you can see that that will then appear in the fixtures. And that's what I'm going to use now to actually load in the fixtures into my Django model. So before I do that in actual fact, what I need to do is I need to clean this data. So a fixture in Django, it needs to be set in a particular way. And the format here doesn't quite match the format that Django is expecting for us to actually insert this data into a database. So let's go ahead and think about how we're going to change this. What we need here, um, let me just build like a, a, a model, if you like, so that we can see what it's meant to look like. So what we need here is we need a field. So this should say uh, fields. And then we're going to need to nest this data inside of our inside of our field here. So this is the format um, that Django is expecting. So we're going to need to perform this action throughout the whole um, document here. Now that's going to be easily done if we just use um, find and replace. So what we do is we find this and then we replace it with that. So let's go ahead and try this. So we're going to find title. And anywhere there's title, what we're going to do is we're going to change it to, to that. Okay, so you can now see that's done throughout the whole document. Now you can see the first one's been repeated. So let's just remove, remove that. Okay, so you can now see that every item here has been changed with the field. So we're now nest or trying to nest this data. Now we are going to need a separate or an additional bracket here. So what we do here is we just grab this one here and now we replace it with the additional bracket and we do that. So we just need to remove that one. Okay, so that now sets up everything nicely. Now the only last thing that we need to do here at the end here, you can see it's red um, down the bottom here. Uh, you can see there's a red item indicating there's a problem down here on the right hand side. So uh, let's go ahead now and just finish that off with our end bracket there, and that should be all that we need to do. So now we have our data, let's go ahead and actually insert it into our database. So that's a simple case of just uh, load data, and then we can describe the name. It's just my data. So load data, my data, let's see if this works. So it's going to take a couple of seconds. What's happening now is that all this data is being inserted into our table. That should take a couple of seconds. If we go over to for example, PG Admin, you can see that up the top here, you can see it's really working hard um, to actually insert all that data into our database. And then once it's done, which it should be now, there we go. So we've installed 1100 fixtures from this file. So if we go back to our database now, or um, PG Admin, we can now inspect this. So let's go over to Books, right click, View Edit Data, All Rows, and there we go. We can now see all the data has been inserted. In addition to that, what we can also do is just run a query uh, to count how many rows we have, for example. So let's go ahead and just run that very quickly. So let's right click query tool. You may be familiar with queries. So I'm just really showing you where you can run queries. So here I can run a query, press run. There we go. So I've got 11,000 items in my book table. So that leaves us now with just the last task of creating a simple form 
a template with a form so that users can actually type in a search query and then we're going to handle that in the view of course we're going to need a url so that we can people can actually get to our template and actually insert or utilize our search form so let's start by yeah let's just go by let's just create a a template folder or templates sorry so let's create a templates folder in books let's just build a template very quickly a new file let's call this index.html there we go and then that's how all that set up so let's now build a url so we are just going to use urls here in our core so let's go ahead and build a new url for this okay so i'm just copying some code in let's call this uh home or oh, no let's call it search okay <clears throat> so we're going to create a new view in a second called post search we've given it a name of post search so from book let's just uh, import views so that just hooks up our url to our view so a user types in a, something into url that gets matched here to a view and then now we need to go to our view here and now we need to build a view for this so let's go ahead and do that so let's build a view so that's our view in place it's called post search so we'll build that out shortly um, so that sets that stage so now we're going to need to return so let's return render and then request and then we'll just send back our our template which is called index.html so let's just double check that we're working everything's on track so manage.py let's uh, run the server okay it looks like it's running okay so let's just uh let's just try this out just see if we can go over okay so it looks like it's running there let's go to search you can see it's picking up my template i don't have anything on my template at the moment but we can just double check that by just typing in something random there refresh you can see that's working so that's all started so let's now actually just create a very simple page with a form so let's start by in books again let's create a new file let's call this forms.py so here we're just going to build a simple form it's a little bit more complicated than it needs to be the form that i'm going to build so here's our form simply put we're going to bring in forms from django so we can start working with forms now this form is going to have one input it's a character field um, and we're going to give it a name if you like of q so what we're now going to do is just make some overrides so this is a code that's going to allow us to kind of make some overrides so i'm going to give the um this field here i'm going to give it a label so i've referred to this field here q i'm going to give it a label search for and also i'm going to add in a class form control so this is a bootstrap class that's just going to allow me to style my form in a very simple way that's kind of styled to bootstrap 4. So that's all that's happening here. I'm creating a new form, which is going to have one field, a character field, and I'm just adding some style to my form. So now what I can do, of course, is I go back here. Let's bring in my form. So from, from forms, let's import my form, which was called post search. I think it was called post search form. Post search form, yep. Yeah. So I'm just importing my form so now i've got this in which is not working oh i'm doing book dot forms there we go uh, so now i've reported my forms let's go ahead and bring the forms into my view so form equals post search form okay so now my form is available and what i can now do is i can pass this form over to my to my view course so let's uh, do exactly that so form and then that's the form data so I can access the form utilizing this keyword here in my template so head back to the template your index template so now what we're going to do is just add that form so we can show the form so you can see what I've done here I've got h1 tag heading 
um, element here and then the form so you can see I'm referencing form as form and I'm utilizing as P so it's going to be displayed um, utilizing paragraphs if you like so there's a few ways to kind of format it just provides a bit of formatting to my form and what I'm doing here is I've got the input form and I'm using some bootstrap classes here just to kind of style this so I've not brought bootstrap in yet but I will do shortly so let's go ahead and refresh and you can now see I've got a nice little form here Okay, so let's go ahead and just to uh, bring in some of the templating code. Right, so here what I've done is I've just pasted in this template code here using HTML5, set the HTML tag language EN, and then I've got some required meta tags here for Bootstrap. And then you can see I'm bringing in the Bootstrap CSS right here. Now I'm using an older version of Bootstrap here just because, and I've changed the title to um, welcome to blog let's just uh, change that here welcome to search so that's my title I've got my head and then the body and then the search form you just saw so let's just finish off by um, just finishing the body here and then the HTML tag so that should now have changed see now that's been styled by bootstrap so now I've got my bootstrap search form now we've completed the form, we need a way of getting the data from that form that the user inputs and actually then querying the database and then potentially returning any matches that are found from the database. So let's just uh, remind ourselves here what's happening. If I right click and inspect it, you can see that we built this form automatically and you can see that the input type here, this input form here, the name is Q. So we're gonna use this name Q to actually try and capture the information within this form here. So let's go ahead and now try and capture that information. So for example, if Q in request. So what we're doing here is when we press, when the user types in text into that input form that's been sent via get uh, html get over to this url here now remember we are directing that data through our url that we set up over to this form so when someone uh, submits that form that's going to be sent across to this this view here so let's go into this view so if in request so we're gonna we bring in request that's all the request information that html uh, request information so we're going to bring all that data in um, through request here. We're going to look in that request and then we're going to check to see if, for example, um, if it's a get request. So if the user has actually pressed that form, that button, they're creating a get request. So we're going to check to see that if someone falls on that page or presses that button, they've made a get request. We're now going to perform a new action. So we're just going to capture that. So what we're going to do is we're going to grab the form. So we're going to grab the form data from the request. Okay. And now what we're going to do is we're going to validate that data. So if form is valid, so if the data in the form is valid, then we're going to do something with it. So what we're going to do now is we're going to get Q equals form dot cleaned data so we're going to get the data what we're going to get or we're going to get q there's a lot of q's here i do apologize so what we're doing here um we're checking to see if q is in the get request and that's kind of like the name of the input if it is we're then going to get the data and then from that data we're then going to check to see if the data is valid whether it kind of matches um what we're expecting now what we're expecting is we're just expecting one field so if that data included um, more fields than that one field, well, then it won't get validated because we're only expecting one piece of information from that input form. So we're then going to clean that data um, inside of the form, Q data, and then we're going to insert that data uh, into Q. Okay, so now we've got that data in Q. So what we can now do Let's just print this out so you can see what's happening. So if we print, for example, Q now, that stands for query, if you like, at this point, and that should now appear here when we type something in. So let's just bring that up here. 
so we can see it down here. So if I type in, just get rid of that, something here, you can now see we're printing out what we just typed in. Lots of windows. Apologies. Okay, so you can now see we kind of type something in here and we're now capturing that information. So this is the query um, that we want to now run against the data we have in our database. So here we're just templating. I'll explain this shortly, but what we're going to do is we're now just going to run, um, let's create a new variable here called results. So that's going to equal, let's go into our book. Uh, so we're going to need to bring in our book. So from book dot uh, models, let's input our book model. So what we're going to need to do here is we need to get book. We need to then get the data, some data from books that match. So uh, dot, let's just run a simple filter. Now I will explain this uh, shortly, but we want to utilize the title field and then we're going to use contains, like I keep saying, I'll explain this in a second, equals Q. So let's now output the results. So let's just go ahead and pass this in. So we're going to say uh, results. So we're going to get the information from results. So we're going to pass the results back to our template. So let's just uh, refresh. Okay, so obviously we're not outputting anything here yet in our template. So let's now go back into our template. That's the template folder index. And what we need to do now is maybe below this form, we're going to need to output our, our results, right? So let's go ahead and create a for loop because we're going to produce lots of results here. So for post in results, so we're going to get that results data. And uh, for each one, we're going to loop around and put it into post and we're going to output something. So let's just go ahead and output, for example, the the title. Okay, so I'm just going to output the total title for each one of those items. And then we'll just end this for. Okay, so we're going to loop everything out. Okay, so that should take the results, loop it all out. Uh, let's go back into our views. So now results won't exist if we don't actually perform any request. So let's just go in and create um, an empty variable here, results. Okay, so now what we should have is the capability of um, typing in, for example, a book, Harry, Potter. Let's go for a search and there we go. So we're now outputting um, our basic search from our database. So I want to tidy this up a little bit in the index form here. So let's go ahead. Now I'm just going to copy and paste this in. So you see what I've done here. I've created this outer div here. It's going to be, this is a basically just copied and pasted from Bootstrap. Here I'm making an album. I've got a container and a new row. Here's my loop that I've just generated, just created uh, to loop for all the results. And what I'm doing is now, as I'm going to create some smaller for each item that's being returned from a database, I'm now going to create a, a column of four and then I'm going to output the, the title and the author. And this is just making a nice little grid, essentially this code here. I'm just building a nice little grid so that um, it's displayed like this. Okay. so. That's essentially what that code does. It just takes it and it builds a nice little list, um, a nice little grid here of results. So we just finish this off, this template by, for example, let's uh, wrap this item here in a container. So we're going to just going to wrap all that up in a container. And that should just align the top section. There we go. So now we're ready to talk about different search techniques. So let's go ahead now and move on to part two, contains and iContains. Textual search operators, basic pattern matching operators have existed in databases for years. 
Django offers two simple options for search. That's contains and iContains. And the main difference here between contains and iContains is that contains is a case sensitive containment test. And then iContains is case insensitive. So let's take a quick look at that in our example. So here in our views, we've added our filter here and we're utilizing contains. So on the left hand side, we have what we want to search. In this case, it's the title field in our database. And on the right hand side, we um, have described contains. And then the queue represents the item or the text that the users typed into the form. So this is the actual um, request from the user, the text from the user. So let's just put this into action. So for example, here, if I type in Harry, you can see that no results are found because remember that we're using contains at the moment and it's case sensitive. However, if I were to type in Harry, that obviously produces all the items in the title field or in the title column in our database that includes the word Harry. So it is very specific. So if I typed in that, for example, obviously there is no instance in that column, in that title uh, column that includes the this set of strings. So it tries to match based upon what's been typed in. And for example, if I type in H-A-R-R, -R, that's going to obviously then match any text that in addition to Harry obviously includes just the letters H-A-R-R. -R. And you can see here down the bottom, uh, you can see that we've got Harry here. Um, so we've got Harrow there. So it's just trying to match any title that includes those specific letters in that order. Let's just go ahead and change this to I contains. So we can see in this instance, if now I type in lowercase Harry, we are now producing the same results like we had when we typed in capital Harry. So we do have a few tools in Django for us to explore our query a little bit further. So for example, here in the results, I'm just going to turn this into a print. So I'm just going to print the result out rather than return. And this time what I'm going to do is I'm going to use dot query at the end. So let's go ahead and have a look at this. So let's move back into our form. Just move that up slightly so we can see what's happening. So this time I'm going to search for Harry again. And this time you can see what's returned is a print of the actual SQL statement that we're utilizing in this query. So what's interesting here in actual fact is that contains is just a Django word um, that gets translated when we translate this into SQL and pass this to our Postgres database. It gets translated into like. So in actual fact, using contains really just converts to SQL like. So if we wanted to explore a little bit more about what that does, for example, we can now use this keyword and search on Google for Postgres database like. What we're really trying to do here is just point you towards the fact that although we're using Django, ultimately we are confined to the technologies that are held or that are connected to our database that we're using. So this is the Postgres uh, database documentation. Here you'll find, for example, pattern matching, and you can read a little bit more about like. So now we know how to actually access the SQL that is going to be run from our query. Let's also have a look at some performance measurements. So here we just remove the query. Let's change this to explain. And this is going to give us some tools to analyze our query. So analyze equals true, for example. So let's go ahead now and just run our query again. And then this time, what we should have now is some information about the query. Here in the terminal, you can now see some statistics about the performance of the query that we've just run. So you can see here, for example, the planning time, execution time. So I'm going to be utilizing the execution time as a measurement uh, for the performance of the queries that we run in this tutorial. So essentially here, this is the time it takes to actually perform the query, return the data. 
Hopefully that's started us off now and whet the appetite to now move into more advanced features. Now we're going to be looking at more specific Postgres database technologies. So first of all, we're going to have a look at the search lookup. So this is where it gets a little bit more interesting utilizing the search lookup. So here we are very specifically talking about Postgres database technologies. Here you can see a common way of using full text search is going to be searching a single term against a single column in a database. And this query here just represents that the title being the column title and then search being the tool that we're going to utilize to search this query, which is just going to be the word Harry in this case. So now we need to look beyond Django and look what's happening behind the scenes with our Postgres database. Our scenario here is that the users typed in Harry into the search form, they press go, and that data has been sent to our Django view. And our view then, or Django has then created our query, send that query to Postgres database. So here we're using the search lookup. So what is going to happen now is Postgres database is going to take all that data from the title column and it's going to convert that data into TS vector. So this is a format that allows then Postgres database to take the query, format that query into a format that can then be used to query the user's query, Harry, to the data that was in the title column. Okay, so that sounds maybe a little bit complex. So let's just break this down slightly. So let's just imagine that the data in the title column, we've just got one row and it's the Harry Potter book. What's going to happen? This data is going to be converted into TS vector data type. So now let's break this down a little bit further. So in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to take this text here, never going to give you up, never going to let you down. So let's just imagine this text was in one of our rows in our database in the title field. So what's going to happen is that that's going to be converted into, into lexemes. And this is what you're seeing down here. So TS vector parses the textual document into tokens. This then further reduces the tokens into lexemes and then returns a TS vector, which is essentially just a list of lexemes together with their position in the document. So here, for example, we have the word give, which is from our initial string here, and then the number three, which is the position. The position in the document. So one, two, three. So this process will merge different variants of words, of the same words. So for example, if we had words here in the title something and some things, well, that would just get removed to just something. And then for example, um, this process would remove duplicates. In addition to that, this process might also remove stop words. So something else you might notice here is that the words, for example, up, uh, and if there's no and here, but these are the type of stop verbs up and uh, down. These are all missing from the end result here. So what you see here, the first argument that's passed to the TS vector is the name of the dictionary to use. So behind the scenes, what we can actually do is select the dictionary we want to use. Uh, so for example, if we had different languages, we might want to perform the request slightly differently because obviously different words mean different things in different languages. So here we've selected English and then to perform this process um, on this string with the English dictionary. This really is a, a, small, a smaller view of a bigger picture where we can really fine tune our search results. So the point I was making here, I think, was that different dictionaries have different stop words. So it, it can make a massive difference on the return or the search return or search results when we're utilizing different dictionaries when we're performing search. So looking deeper into the subject area, you will find there's lots of fine tuning that you can make here in this process in order to further enhance your search results. So hopefully that's given you an introduction to TS Vector, what's happening behind the scenes here. 
Now we need to move across to the plain to TS query. So what's happening to our, our search query? And I guess in some respects, it's the same type of process. We're preparing whatever someone's typed in in a way that's going to help us better perform and create more effective results. So now let's take a look at the actual query. So PostgreSQL provides the functions uh, to TS query and plain to TS query uh, for converting the query, the user's query, to TS query data type. And that's what we need then use to kind of compare it against our TS vector to actually then produce the search results. So there are two functions here, to TS query and plain in plain plain to TS query. So these two options will provide different features. Now here in Django, when we utilize this search lookup, it will be utilizing the plain to TS query option. To break this down a little bit, the to TS query offers access to more features. So plain to TS query, the text is going to be parsed. So remember, we're taking the query, the user's query, that that text is going to be parsed and normalized. And then all the characters are going to be escaped. And then an and is then placed between the words. So we're plain to TS query. We can't um, utilize Boolean operators, weight labels. So these type of features, prefix match labels in the input. So it just doesn't, it just lacks some of the features that we can, um, that we might want to use to enhance our search. So for example here, this might be an example of um, what we might want to include. So for example here, it, utilizing 2TS query, um, this offers more access to more features. Um, so we can use input weights. Uh, so here, for example, you can see that we've tried to add some weights on different words. You can see that we're also uh, utilizing uh, different Boolean operators here potentially to in order to kind of en enhance our search. So I realize that I'm skimming across what is a very deep hole, but I'm just trying to give you a flavor of potentially what's happening behind the scenes and the type of features and functions that you might want to explore further. Ultimately, what's happened here is we've now prepared the document, the search data that we want to search against, and we've also now prepared the query. Now we move back to the view. Now let's just put this into action. You can see that I've made some, made some notes here for you on the first two options, contain, I contains. So let's now move across to search. So the query is exactly the same here. We're just querying one field in our database. And this time I'm going to utilize search instead of contains. And this is the query that's being entered. So let's go back to the web page here. Let's type in Harry again, let's press search. And you can see now it says unsupported lookup, search for character field or join on the field, not permitted. So the reason why that is, is because we haven't actually turned on all the Postgres database tools, so to speak. So let's go into now the core settings. And what we now need to do is in the installed apps, we need to now bring in all the tools so we can start to utilize some of these proprietary, prior, 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 some of these <laughs> proprietary uh, tools from the Postgres database. And there we go. So installed apps, django.contrib.postgres. And then let's go back into here and refresh. And you can now see we have search. So hopefully that has given you an insight, a starting point to explore that further. We now know what's happening when we utilize this search feature that we just used in the query. We know how to then hook into the Postgres database technology so that all of those actions that we described can be performed. And we now have a set of results. So now we're going to move across to search vector. Now we are still utilizing all these great tools in the Postgres full text search toolkit. Now let's just break this down. So essentially what we've done so far is we've moved across from contains or like over to Postgres full text search. So instead of finding records based upon, for example, simple string matching, we are now very much finding records based upon semantics and knowledge of the language. That's the process, or that's what we're really looking into when we started to talk about and having a look into TS Vector. This type of process allows us to produce better results based on semantics and knowledge 
of the language. So we use, for example, different libraries. So what we saw in the previous example was the most simplest way to start using full text search in Django with Postgres database, utilizing search. So searching against a single field, like we saw with search, is great, but it's rather limiting. So what we have here is search vector. Using search vector will allow us to search multiple fields. To utilize search vector, you can see that we've imported it in from the Postgres toolkit that we set up. So in the settings, remember we added the app here, the Postgres toolkit, uh, so that we could then add now search vector. So we grab this tool. So now what we're going to do in results, we're going to grab the data from books, objects. This time we're going to annotate. So we're going to add some additional information here. So search is going to equal both title and author. So essentially what we're doing here in this search vector is we're just going to tell Postgres database that we want to include the title and author field column, sorry. So we're going to then pass that data across to our filter search, and then we're going to query that against our user's input. So let's take a look at this in action. So here, for example, we produce some books utilizing our old query. So now let's just type in Harry here. So what we should return now is not only the title that begins with Harry, but also the author. So we press search. You can now see if we move down here, we can see that we've got some authors that are returning Harry, as well as some titles that include Harry. So now we've seen Postgres full text search in action, both on a single column and multiple columns. Now let's talk a little bit about search rank. In the Postgres SQL full text toolkit, we have a ranking function. So ranking attempts to measure how relevant documents are to a particular query. So that when there are many matches, the most relevant ones can be shown first. So behind the scenes, Postgres database does provide a few different options here uh, for ranking, which can take into account, for example, lexical proximity, structural information. Um, they may also be able to consider how many times the, the word appears, for example, in the document or how close the terms are together if there's multiple terms the user's typing in. The bigger picture here is that we can fine tune this system. So for example, we can ha add optional weights uh, to words, for example, and we can include that so searches can utilize that information when users perform searches. Let's take a look at an example here. Right, so now we're going to import search query, search rank, search vector. So we're gonna line all this up. So our vector is going to be here, our title column, and then we're gonna set our query as Q. That's what the user's typed in. So that's going to be passed here to the search query. And now we're going to set out our results. So let's, like we've done before, let's grab the books table and we're going to now annotate. So what we're going to do here is we're going to set up our vector, our title column and our query. We're going to pass that in, perform that. And now we're going to ask Postgres database to perform the search rank function. So that's going to now perform the search rank function, and that's now going to return uh, the ranked results from our vector and our query, the results from our query on our, on our search vector. So let's go ahead now and perform order by. Now we're going to order by rank descending. So let's go ahead and... So now we can complete this by grabbing the books table or selecting the books table. Now we use annotate. So what we're going to do here is we're going to pass into the search rank function our vector, the title, the column that we want to search against and our query. And that's then going to be passed into the search rank function. So Postgres database is going to perform the ranking. And then what we can then do is order by rank. So let's take a look at this in action. So this is what we had before. Maybe we can remember some of that. Now let's search. You can now see we have a different set of results, which essentially now has been passed through the ranking function of Postgres. And we've now ordered this in, in our nice list. And we have our top result here. Just to provide me some more information, I'm just going to also pass across Q to the template. So 
So now heading back to the template loosely put, I'm going to check to see if there is any data that's being returned. If there is, then I'm just going to count it and return the count here. So the outcome of this will be this here. And I just wanted to point this out because I am returning everything inside of the title column, which is rather large. And you probably saw that when we did the search, it was taking a little bit of time to complete. So you might want to take that into consideration or do some sort of pagination when you're performing this, because uh, you probably don't want to return 11,000 results. So let's now move on to an optional argument, weights. So typically weights are used to mark words from special areas of a document. Take, for example, a research paper. A research paper would have maybe a title, an abstract, and then the body of content. If we wanted to search this, maybe the abstract area has keywords that are more important or relevant to the search rather than the body. So the words in the abstract area, we could treat this with more or less importance than words in the document body. This is a representation of the built-in weighting system from 0.1 to 1.0 in Postgres database. So here, these weights are associated with letters. So 0.1 is D weight, then C weight, B weight, and the 1.0, the highest weight, is A. So what we can do is we can apply A, B, C, or D to, for example, uh, in, the exa in the example I provided earlier with the research paper, we could, for example, give the abstract column a weight A because it has more importance, and then maybe the body content, uh, for example, D. So it's just less importance. So that way, the words in the body column of our database will have less importance than the words in the abstract column. So let's go ahead and put this into action. So here you can see I've changed the vector now. So we're going to have search vector title with a weight of B and then a search vector author with a weight of A. So here I'm weighting the authors uh, with more importance. So what we should see if we run our query again, we should see a change in our query. So let's go ahead and search again. And you can now see that seems to be the case because our results are completely different. And you can see here that we have more, uh, it looks like we have more emphasis upon the author's name having H-A-R-R. -R, because again, it's not just matching Harry here. It's, it's taking, for example, just HHR and it's doing partial matches here. So here we have Harry, Harris, Harry, 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 and so on. So let's just go ahead and switch these over. So let's go for B with the author and A with the title. We'll give that a go and you can see that we're going to completely change the results again. And this time you can see that the titles are more predominant. To further enhance ranking, something new in Django 3.1 is normalization and cover density parameters. So in actual fact, if I just press comma here, it's going to give me a list of all the different options I have available. So you can see here we've got vector query weights, normalization none. So by default, cover density is false. So the cover density parameter, setting it to true, this enables the cover density ranking which essentially means that the proximity of matching query terms is taken into account. So this is something you might feel that your results will benefit from. So let's go ahead and just apply this. Um, so this is cover density equals, just set that to true. So let's go ahead now and just see what happens here, just to maybe some of the top results. You can see that potentially there wasn't any changes in the top results here. In regards to normalization, rank normalization, this is where you need to read through a little bit and get a little bit more information, which will help you fine tune a little bit further. So it's really hard to provide any tangible information at this point, because it's going to be very specific to your use case. Hopefully that's given you a starting point for you to research further into search rank. There definitely is a lot of options there we have available in order to help improve the result or tailor results to your particular use case. So now we're gonna move on to a completely different technique for search, trigram search. 
A trigram is a group of three consecutive characters taken from a string. So the idea here is that we can measure the similarity of two strings by counting the number of trigrams that they share. So let's just take this example here, this string cat. So this can be broken down into a set of trigrams, C, C, A, cat, and at. So that's something we can search against. So imagine now we typed in the word mat. That would then also be turned into a set of trigrams. And from the word mat, for example, the query that we typed in, we can now compare it against cat here. And we can see that mat and cat have some similarities. The A and the T will be correct. So we could say that there are some similarity between the word cat and mat, and that can then be calculated as a search result. This technique will work on larger strings and sentences. So here, for example, we take the word or two words, Chateau Blanc, and we can then break that down into a set of trigrams. Once this process is finished, we could, for example, take out any repetitions. And then we can use this against, for example, the query that's typed in to then work out a similarity. If we were to head back into PG Admin, we can actually run some queries and try some of this out. Now, before we do this, what we need to do is just make sure that we go into our database here and then run and create a new extension. So right click, create extension. You can see I've already added it here, PGTRGM. So just type it in here and search for it. PG underscore and so on. So it's not on my list because I've already added it, but you're going to need to add PG Trim, press save, and that's then going to add the extension so that we can utilize some of this technology. Let's right click on our table, query tool. That brings up our query tool here. What we can do here is we can actually run some queries and actually see this in action. So for example, let's just see, for example, some trigrams for this sentence here. I love Django search. So I'll go ahead and run this. And there we go. So we can see all the trigrams for this sentence. We can also perform some simple uh, word similarity checks. So for example, let's go ahead and run select word similarity, word, two words. So we'll run that. And what we have is an output here, a number corresponding to the similarity, one being similar, one, 0 0.1 being not so similar. So let's go ahead now and select our table so what we're going to do here is we have a table called book inside a book we have some columns which is title so let's go ahead and see if we can run a similarity so let's select title let's use a word similarity and what we're going to do is we're going to take the title and what we're going to do is we're going to um what we're going to be doing here is we're going to pass a query, say, from the user, maybe they've typed in Harry Potter. So they're looking for Harry Potter as word uh, similarity. Okay, so we've selected title, that's the column, um, word similarity. So we're gonna do now word similarity um, on the title, and we're gonna check for the word Harry Potter to find any matches. So that's from the book book table. So now what we need to do is just get this printed out. So where title um, Harry Potter and then let's do an order by uh, order by word similarity. And then that can be descending. Okay, so that's our query. We're essentially going to run a word similarity on the word or the phrase Harry Potter in our book book table on the title column. So let's just run this and we've got a syntax error for some reason. Let's take a look at this. Syntax error in line one, Harry Potter. Any ideas? Um, so comma, word similarity, title, comma, Harry Potter. Okay, I'm not entirely sure what the problem was there, but it's uh, it's working. So 
let's go ahead and we can now see the similarity. So you see the first result here with a similarity of 0.4 is Harry Potter collection, Harry Potter 1 to 6. So this is essentially what we're going to now search and perform this query essentially in Django against the user's input. Let's take a look at what this looks like in Django. So from Django search, we've imported trigram similarity. We've enabled the extension on our Postgres database. That's important. So now we're going to create a, a query. So books object annotate similarity equals trigram similarity. So we take in or we pass in the field that we want to use title and then we're going to take in the query from the user and then we're going to run a filter so here we can run a filter similarity greater than 0 0.1 because remember what's being returned here we saw this is a result so we saw that harry potter had what is it 0.8 um, similarity so we could utilize that to filter out the result from our search result and then we can then go ahead and order by similarity so in descending order so now we can go ahead and test this out. So let's type in Harry Potter again. And there we go. So we saw that the same results occur like we performed in PG Admin, Harry Potter collection. So probably what we can do now is move this up to, for example, 0 0.8. And then that should filter out even further. Maybe that's a little bit too high. Let's just move this down to 6. So you can see that we can start to fine tune the results utilizing this filter here to return a different set of results or to filter out results based upon uh, essentially a weighting system. Hopefully that's given you an introduction to trigram similarity. So let's talk a little bit about trigram distance. Using trigrams, we can also query for the distance between two words. So this is calculated normally by taking the similarity of the word from one. So distance equals word, sorry, distance equals one, take away similarity of word one and word two. So the lower the number, the more similar or less distance they have. So if you think about a feature here, imagine you typed in a word Harry Potter, you could potentially now build a feature which potentially is a, oh, did you mean feature? So you could build a did you mean engine at this point. So someone types in a word, you could have a new entry or new facility in that application, which pops up a nice little list of, oh, did you mean this? And that can be all generated from utilizing this trigram distance approach. So I appreciate there's a lot to probably to take in here or to think about, and it's well worth reading over this. Hopefully I've given you, like I keep saying, kind of a starting point here. So let's just go ahead now and bring this in and start utilizing it. So trigram distance, and essentially all we're going to do at this point is uh, probably just swap this over, for example. So let's go ahead and swap that over. Actually, I just uh, copy this down. So books object annotate similarity. So we call this now distance equals trigram distance. That didn't quite work. Trigram distance. And then we're taking the title and that's the column we want to work on. And then our query. And this time we're going to filter by distance. And that would be less than or equal to. Uh, so let's just stick maybe five. 0.5 and then we can order by in this case distance okay so I'll just move up my distance to 0.8 let's go ahead and have a look so we we'll search Harry Potter and there we go so we do get similar results um, but we've now searched by distance now let's look at headline and what that provides us in terms of search results so let me show you what this does. So let's bring in search headline, search query, search vector, set up our query as per normal. So we're taking the user's input, our vector. So we're going to search on the author's field for no particular reason, sorry, column, for no particular reason. It's just easier to show you in this example. And then we're going to run our queries, a so book object, annotate, search ve vector, and then the headline equals search headline. Okay. And then we're going to pass in authors. So we're going to run this search on the authors column and then our query. And then we're going to run a filter search equals query. So that should just output 
a general search result. So search here, you can see we've got a general search result. Okay, so now we can use this headline feature. So here, for example, I've uh, headline equals search headline. So let's utilize that. So let's go into our template here. And normally what we do is we t from post, we uh, generate our author. So let's take away author now and then let's call this headline. Okay, so let's just um, output our headline. So let's go back here and refresh. And you can now see the default option is bold. So you can see here um, what's happened is headlines placed a, a B tag where it finds occurrences of the word that we typed in. So in this case, rolling. And you can see that that has then highlighted those key words. So let's try and do the same thing, um, for example, with two, two words. So let's just go for J and K. So you can see what's happened here. Um, it's taken J and K, and you can see that it's um, put the bold tags in both instances. And so it's essentially just highlighting the, the words that we're trying to search against. So the default option is bold, but we can change that, of course. So what we can do here is define the start and the stop cell. So after our query here, we can define the start cell. And then in addition to that, we can also define the stops cell. Okay, so let's give that a go. So we refresh again. And this time there should be a spam. Well, let's just try this with, it's just easier to see. Let's just go ahead and inspect that. You can now see we've got our span here. Just some additional functionality that might come into use or you might want to utilize within your application. That brings us nicely to indexing. It's definitely worth reading through indexing if you are serious about performance of your application. Just to quickly try and summarize for our case in this tutorial. So let's think of uh, a database index as a data structure that we can build on our database to improve the performance or speed of our data retrieval operations. Now, because we are performing search requests, we are naturally trying to retrieve a lot of data in order to then search, uh, perform search, and then return results to the user. So ultimately, indexing is going to help us speed up querying. So if you head over to the documentation, the Django documentation, and for example, in the search here, just type in uh, Postgres indexes or gin index, for example, that's going to take you to this page here where it's going to talk and show you a little bit more about the options we have for Postgres specific model indexes. So there are a range of indexes here. So this hole gets deeper. Most definitely there are different types of indexes that you want to use in different situations. Now, just for this example, we're going to choose a gin index. We're going to apply this gin index and you can then go ahead and read about these indexes and apply these indexes in the same way in actual fact, more or less. So let's go ahead. We're going to use gin index here to build an index. And what I'm going to try and showcase to you is the performance increase potentially that is gained from creating an index. So the first up, what we're going to need to do is to actually activate our index. So we apply an index in this case onto our model and we're going to apply an index, create an index of our title field, right? So let's go ahead and do that. So we need to uh, class meta. So we're going to add this to class meta and then we're going to create indexes equals. So we're going to, I spelled that wrong. We're going to, um, we're going to create an index. Now we've selected gin index. So let's just go ahead and bring this in. So from our Postgres, remember we included that earlier in our installed apps. So now we're going to import gin index. Okay. So with that said, let's go ahead now and do exactly that. So we're going to bring our gin index. What we need to do here is we just need to uh, name so I'm going to give it a name so we can actually see it in a second when we go to PG admin. So let's just call this new gin index. Okay. So that will allow us to track the index 
in our database so we can see it's actually been created and then let's go ahead now and apply this index to uh, our field so that's going to be in this case just i'm just going to put it on title obviously you could add authors in there if you wanted to uh, so there we go that for now is what we're going to need so we bring in engine index and then we run or we set up our index here in our meta so once we've done this what we're going to need to do at this point is we're going to need to migrate so let's go ahead and make migrations okay so you notice at this point um, we're now going to create an index a new gin index now in this state if we try to go ahead and actually migrate let's just give it a go this won't actually work migrate you can see what we've got here is that um, we're we don't know what data type this title is so it, this can't be read this is generally what's happening here so what we need to do here is we need to just go ahead and into our migrations and we need to go into our migration here and we just need to go ahead and bring some tools in here the B tree uh, gin extension so that this our 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 data type can then be read or translated into something that the database can utilize so first up in our migration here let's just go from uh, Postgres operations let's import the btree gin extension so we need to do that first and then what we need to do down in the operations here now just before the migration dot add index let's go ahead and bring in our btree gin index extension uh, this is essentially an extension so I think maybe from the experience we had previously you know what's going to happen here an extension is going to be installed we could have just done that manually of course are right here um, so if I went into here and typed in B tree uh, it doesn't look like B tree gin um, we could have uh, created that manually uh, but let's just go ahead and do this so let's just go ahead now and migrate so that's been migrated let's go back into here and refresh oh cancel that uh, let's just uh, refresh this you can now see the btree gin has been added the extension so that's just a different way of adding the extension everything's been migrated so now what we can do is we can see if our index has been created so let's go back into let's just freshen this up so in our table let's go to the query tool again and let's run this query so select all from pg indexes so we're looking for all the indexes where table name not like pg okay so you can see by doing that uh, this brings up some of the indexes and down the bottom here we have the new gin index and that's the index that we've just created so key here is that we're explicitly telling django to utilize this index whenever we query potentially this this field here this title field so let's go ahead first let's just go ahead and turn this off so what I've done is I've gone ahead I've created two created two queries here that we're just going to print out and we're going to use explain to analyze the results so a simple filter here uh, title trigram similar uh, and then here we're going to use the trigram similarity option here so just two queries here that we're going to run now it's important that I've I've highlighted this out here so we're not going to be utilizing the gin index to begin with so let's go ahead and just try out this performance so we're going to run the server I'll then press search or actually let's go for Harry Potter so nothing is going to be returned simply because we've not set that up so don't worry about that so you can see here we've got two results okay so um, our two results here execution time so we're saying that the execution time is basically the time it's taken to perform all the operations and return the results so 46 milliseconds here and down here 47 so that's how long it's taken that's how long the users had to wait to get their results back to them loosely speaking so in its current state this is not going to work so even though for example we we're to go ahead and turn on the models and give us a go this is not going to work at this point because there's one thing missing and it's not abundantly clear unfortunately in the django documentation but with this type of setup 
uh, we're utilizing here uh, trigram similarity. Uh, what we're going to need to do here in our gin index, we're going to add an additional property here. So this is going to be the OP classes. So essentially this is going to be also the hook that's going to hook um, our query um, to the index that we want to utilize. So let's go ahead and what we're going to need to do now because we've made that change is we're going to need to have to make migrations again and then migrate so we've made a new index you can see that we removed the old index we created a new index and now let's go into uh, our server that is here if you remember the previous search results it took around about 46 milliseconds that was say the performance so what we can do now, now we've connected our index. Let's go ahead and search, same search again. Let's go ahead and try. And you can now see we're performing an execution time of three milliseconds. And that's a massive difference from when we weren't using the index. So that just highlights maybe some of the performance increases that might be achieved uh, for utilizing an index. So we've gone through the gears, we're looking at different approaches. Uh, there are def there's definitely lots of different things now to potentially research. There are definitely a lot of options here. And hopefully having that idea about index is going to help you at this point. And this is something that can actually be applied uh, not just for search, but potentially through your Django application in other instances or other use cases. So potentially it's well worth having a research or having a look into. Thank you very much for listening. If you've managed to get to the end, it's been a rather long process. I hope you've enjoyed the process. And again, I can't thank you enough if you have got right to the end and you've listened throughout. Hopefully it was valuable. If there is any comments, that would be fantastic. If there's anything else you think I can improve upon. Um, there's lots of things. Yeah, we've, we've missed lots of things here and I've skimmed across lots of different topics. But like I keep saying, hopefully you've now got a, a better overview of Django full text search with the Postgres database. That just leads me to say thank you very much again and I hope to see you in the next tutorial.